All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to an infectious disease subspecialty case discussion. Uh, my name is Maddie Conti, and I'll be facilitating the session today. Uh, so today we have two incredible ID clinicians here from UCSF, uh, our case discussant, Dr. Monica Gandhi, and our case presenter, Dr. Jorge Salazar. Uh, so we are really excited to um, learn from them both today and learn from the case that Jorge has prepared for us. Uh, so I'm actually going to pass the microphone to them to uh, introduce each other and um, even share a, any story of an experience that, that they've had together. Um, so Jorge, I'll pass the mic to you and um, thank you again for presenting a case. And would you like to introduce our fantastic case discussant today? Absolutely. Thanks so much, Maddie. And thank you everyone joining us. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, I, I want to introduce Dr. Uh, Monica Gandhi, uh, who's my pleasure to introduce. She's a professor of medicine and associate division chief of HIV infectious disease and global medicine at San Francisco General Hospital. She also serves as director of UCSF Center for AIDS Research, uh, CIFAR, and she's a fearless leader in her role as medical director of Ward 86, uh, which is San Francisco General Hospital's HIV clinic, which we're proud to say is the first established HIV clinic uh, in the country. Um, I first met Monica during my uh, fellowship interview at UCSF, and uh, the first thing I really noticed was just her enthusiasm, her energy, and um, her great wisdom, which I've continued to see through my fellowship training here. Uh, she's so loved by many and a, is an incredible mentor and um, huge inspiration to, to myself and many others. Um, Thank you. So that is uh, my introduction to Dr. Gandhi. <laughs> well, that is so such a nice introduction. And I guess I would like to introduce Jorge Salazar, who is um, really impressive to me because when we interviewed him for fellowship, we really wanted him and we weren't sure that he would come here. We were very excited when he matched here. And what I have been so proud of Jorge about is that he has a goal. He is going to do a research career, which is, you know, we're we're struggling in infectious disease. I hope all of you end up going into ID because we <laughs> had lower rates of people going into infectious disease. We're like, the lowest paid specialty, but that doesn't matter. You're doing it for the love of it. Um, and uh, beyond that, we've been having less and fewer and fewer people go into HIV research. And so um, Jorge is extremely devoted to the populations that he serves. We serve a very vulnerable population at Ward 86, all in poverty, essentially, and um, really interested. He's specifically interested in the Latino population, Latino, Latina. And I'm proud of him because he is going to be doing great work in either long acting or just figuring out how to help this population as he goes forth with research. So it's really my pleasure to be around Jorge. And I know Maddie. Right. Monica. And Monica, I'm, I'm yeah. still proud of you more though. So <laughs> just putting that out there. That's our story that like once I was mentoring him and then we had a conversation, I said, I'm proud of you, Jorge. And then he goes, I'm proud of you too. <laughs> I thought that was very nice of him. <laughs> I love that. I love that story. Well, um, huge honor to have both of you here. And um, we're all really excited to, to learn from you both. And um, Jorge, thank you so much for preparing the case. Um, so I know we have you know, quite a long and interesting case. So I think we should um, go ahead and jump into it. Um, so Jorge, whenever you're ready, you can um, present the first aliquot. And then we'll pause and hear Monica's thoughts. Okay, so um, the chief complaint is generalized weakness, fatigue, and weight loss. So we have a 44-year-old transgender woman uh, recently diagnosed with HIV AIDS. Uh, her CD4 is 14 with a viral load in the 2 million. She was actually seen at uh, Ward 86 just before uh, her presentation with her new HIV diagnosis, which came from an HIV screening test. Uh, she got some labs and had been started on ART. But the very next day she uh, went to the ED and had been complaining of about three to four weeks of just feeling unwell, some weakness, uh, so much to the point that she had trouble getting out of her own bed. Uh, had also mentioned some unintentional weight loss, which she said was about 80 pounds. 
Again, this is around the same time, three to four weeks. Um, she had uh, no dyspnea, but had this chronic non-productive cough, uh, which she'd had for several years, but mentioned it was worse recently. Um, no fevers, no chills or sweats. Um, the remainder of her ROS, I guess some pertinent stuff was she had been having some dysphagia, a dinophagia. She had mentioned some frontal uh, headaches with photophobia. And this was for the past two weeks. Uh, she described it as intermittent and uh, sharp in quality. Uh, no neck pain, uh, no confusion. And then she mentioned having a tinnitus bilaterally. All right, thank you, Jorge. This is um, quite a lot of interesting history already. And Monica, I really wanted to turn over to you to hear kind of what's going through your mind when thinking of all, when hearing this history and particularly how does the patient's recent HIV diagnosis with that CD4 count impact how you're thinking about uh, the different symptoms that the patient is reporting? Yeah, so um, I am really worried about this person because essentially a really low CD4 count. So at 14, um, you know, really this is indicating probably not an acute infection, but a chronic infection just got diagnosed, but has had it for a while. And at this point, so many opportunistic infections are possible because of that really low C4 count. So we could, you know, kind of start with each symptom and then give a differential for that. But for example, the generalized weakness can go along with any of these. So let's go to weight loss. I mean, weight loss can be, of course, um, you know, very concerned about cancer, very concerned about lymphoma because patients with low C4 counts are really susceptible to EBV related lymphomas. Um, and could be a symptom of like generalized HIV, but that's a profound weight loss. So we're already into, um, you know, concern for, for B symptoms from um, cancer and then HIV itself. And then when we now we have a cough, so we don't know yet if we're going to have hypoxemia on the exam, um, doesn't feel dysnic, but certainly a non-productive cough. We have to think about so many things that could be happening in the lungs. And, um, we really, every time I think of a differential for a, a person living with HIV, I always think of the four infectious diseases. So I think of the four categories. So I start with um, bacterial, then I go to fungal, then I go to parasitic, and then I go to viral. And so in terms of bacterial, with that weight loss and that cough, we have to think about TB and non-tuberculous uh, non mycobacteria that are causing lung disease and um, could be like a pyogenic bacteria like strep, but um, doesn't sound like that with a productive. And so I'm gonna stick with the kind of that differential for non, for um, for bacterial causes of cough and weight loss. Though I think we also have to think of things like echinococcus or like um, really weird um, differentials for weird bacteria that can cause like smoldering cough and weight loss. And that would be like an, a mixed anaerobic infection um, or norcardia, uh, this patient is susceptible to. Um, so think about the weird gram-positive organisms in the gram-positive, uh, in the bacterial category. Gram-negative, I think, would would do more pyogenic and more greenish. So I'm gonna stick with gram-positive bacteria, gram-positive rods, really, and then mycobacterial species. Um, and then let's go to um, fungal. Uh, and that's really PCP is the main fungi that's in this category. Absolutely susceptible to PCP with that low C4 count, can be a non-productive cough, doesn't have to feel dysnic right away. Um, and, and it's been going on for a while. So I think PCP is the main differential. Um, you can get cryptococcal pneumonia. You absolutely can. Um, and you can also get all of the non-endemic fungi causing um, chronic non-productive uh, cough. So that would be histo and blasto and coxy and paracoxy and, uh, and depending on where, um, you know, the risk factors are, uh, where the person was born and um, where they've been living. Coxy would be more um, common here. And then let's go over to parasitic toxonomonia, possible, um, rare. So I'm going to kind of skip that. And then, and then lots of viral pneumonias. Um, and that would really be, um, you know, uh, essentially uh, CMV pneumonias, um, 
uh, which is rarer in our population living with HIV than the transplant population, but not with such a low CD4 count. Um, so that is still on our differential lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis, which is I put in the category of non-infectious of all of those, but LIP has viral origins, so I'm sticking it here as well. Um, and then uh, just any of the the other viral pneumonias, um, uh, and you know that we all can see in RSV and COVID and um, other viral pneumonias. Going back just to a minute, um, actually, I should have mentioned under. Um, uh, Okay, that's okay. I just lost my train of thought for a minute. Okay, so that's that's the four categories of just in the lung. So now we're seeing how much can be going on. And then no fevers, chills, and night sweats, dysphagia. So this is really absolutely can happen more than one thing can be happening at once. So we have to think about what affects the esophagus and end stage AIDS. And that really is anywhere. It's really mainly the viral um, uh, illnesses, so HSV, CMV, HIV itself. Then again, we're going out of four categories. So think about the fungi. Canada is the most likely cause of adenophagia and dysphagia going all the way down. And then, um, and then not really parasitic um, and uh, wouldn't worry about bacterial causes. So then we go to frontal headache. Unfortunately, so many things happening. So frontal headache, and um, some photophobia, we had to worry about things in the CNS. And really at this point, we're most worried um, with such a low C4 count for cryptococcal meningitis. But um, again, you have to go down each of your categories. So when I just said something in the fungal category, but of course all those other endemic fungi can be in the head like coxy meningitis um, or histo or depending where they're from, then go to bacterial Think about your mycobacterial and non and non TB mycobacterial illnesses um, causing uh, CNS problems, and then um, going back to uh, viral illnesses. One thing that keeps on coming up is CMV, um, and especially with the blurry vision that has been uh, described. Right eye blurry vision, really perfect, unfortunately, candidate for CMV, retinitis, CMV. Um, either encephalitis or meningitis, but in this case, it'd be more likely to be encephalitis. So every time you think of something, just think that everything could be going on. We could have all of what I just said, all of this could be happening because when you have such low CD4 counts, multiple OIs are possible. And always divide your categories into fungal, bacterial, parasitic, viral, going back to parasitic in the head, we have to think about toxo and also CNS lymphoma. And then always have a category for non-infectious in HIV. And that usually is cancer. Um, uh, we, so we could have a perineoplastic syndrome if she has a lymphoma that's causing the brain findings. It's of course related probably to an infection at some level if it's EBV related, but think about, um, always think about that other category of, of um, rheumatologic or, or non-infectious causes in our people living with HIV. So really broad, differential, need more information, could be multiple things happening at once. Lots of workup needs to be done. Wow, that, uh, that was just phenomenal. I think I really love how you highlighted that, you know, more than one thing can be happening here, especially as you highlighted in this immunocompromised host, there could doesn't just have to be one unifying diagnosis, but there could be multiple processes happening. And um, also just love the clarity of your teaching. Just think of kind of the four buckets of the types of infections, bacterial, fungal, parasitic, viral. Um, thank you for that. Uh, all right, Jorge, we can move on to the next aliquot. Here, yeah, I'll get into the past medical history here. So um, she was also known to have a right co uh, corneal ulcer back in uh, October of 2020. No one really knew what what that was about. Uh, it was just noted in her uh, history. Um, substance use, which included use of stimulants and opioids. Um, she had some uh, psychosis that wasn't really specified. Uh, surgical history, um, noted that she had a colostomy due to a perforated colon. This was in her childhood. Not too much information about that either. Um, medications, uh, she had been prescribed Victarvi, but again, had only just taken for a day. Uh, nothing for allergies. And then um, her social history, originally from Southern California, but had li been living in San Francisco for the past year. Uh, she was living in an SRO, so a uh, single room occupancy. Uh, access to food, uh, so no issues with food insecurity. 
Um, so I mentioned the substance use. So she did use uh, via injection with um, methamphetamine, heroin, fentanyl, had some daily alcohol use. Uh, getting into sexual history, uh, sexually active with both uh, men and women. Um, and then nothing uh, remarkable in terms of like exotic animals or farm animals or any travel history. And uh, her family history was unknown. All right, perfect. So maybe we can pause here and Monica, does any um, kind of, how does this additional information about the past medical history and social history kind of impact how you're thinking about this patient and does it impact any of the differential you're considering? Um, yes, just a couple of things. So um, I didn't see extensive travel to anywhere else but California. So if we're going to in, in, invoke any of the endemic fungi, uh, either in the in the CNS issue, in the lungs, um, uh, then we have to think that coxie is the most likely. Uh, TB is just because there hasn't been travel, you know, elsewhere, doesn't mean that TB isn't still a possibility, um, has had a lot of it kind of exposures. Um, uh, use IV drugs maybe around people that have had TB. So I would not, I don't think that in any way, you know, makes TB less likely. Um, and I do, doesn't know, if, I don't know if there's been any jail history. Um, and then in terms of the substance use, you know, you didn't um, describe um, findings of Bartonella, but, um, and we'll get into the exam and we'll look in the mouth and we'll look at, um, you know, signs of, for example, Bartonella endocarditis or cat scratch, which is used to be called hat, hat, cat scratch disease because it comes from Hensley. And the way I think of Bartonella Hensley coming from cat scratch disease, I think it sounds like hiss. So then that's how I remember. And then Bartonella uh, uh, cat scratch and then Quintata is what you can get from fleas and really just sort of from living in an SRO, unfortunately not. Um, you know, there's a lot of flea exposure in there. And Bartonella species, um, you know, really... Um, uh, uh, plague people living with HIV with very low CD4 counts. Um, and so we uh, uh, definitely, uh, you know, definitely ask them to stay away from cats and, and, um, and, and just think about it, chronic endocarditis in this case as well, causing the weight loss and causing the dwindling and causing the fatigue. And so I don't think that Bartonella endocarditis is off, off of this. You know, I think that has to be brought into the picture given the risk factors for um, exposure to Bartonella. And then we'll and you, when we look in the mouth if there's oral hairy leukoplakia or anything that's related to to any findings of any of these. So we're going to get into the exam and I'm really curious about some of these. Really have to look in the eye when you're giving the exam and get an ophthalmologist to come and look in the eye because we've got to look at the back of it because we're so worried about CMV in this patient. Yeah, yeah, jumping off that. So you mentioned the importance of looking in the mouth and the eye. Are there any other you know specific parts of the exam that are uh, you would say are really important given this patient's immunocompromised status or any as other aspects about the history? Um, yeah, any other we, parts of the physical exam you're focusing on? We do have to look at cranial nerves, signs of ele elevated intracranial pressure because we're going to go down an LP track um, with this patient with the photophobia and the headache. Um, and so have to, I mean, of course they'll get a CT um, most likely, but, um, but look for signs of elevated intracranial pressure, which is often... Uh, cranial nerves, um, four, five, and six being involved at the beginning, and look for that, look for, um, uh, so careful um, uh, uh, neuro exam, eye exam that you won't be able to do, you know, I think as internists on our own, we need a dilated exam to look in the back of the eye, um, look for nuchal rigidity, uh, look, listen to the heart for the Bartonella, um, for any questions of endocarditis, um, look for perineal plastic signs, which usually rash if it's um, Kind of outside, and then look for um, signs of MAC or lymphoma, which would be hepatitis by um, or lymph nodes. Um, so those are the main things. And look for any skin findings, because we could have always like more than one thing. All right, Jorge, um, you can take it away with the next aliquot. All right, so yeah, I'll do the vitals and then the exam. So uh, vitals, her temp was uh, 98.6 exactly Fahrenheit or 37 Celsius. Uh, her heart rate was 90, blood pressure 102 over 65. Uh, respiratory rate was normal 20. 
uh, O2 was 99%. Um, and I'll also just add her weight here. It was 112 pounds or a uh, little over 50 kilograms. Um, for her exam, generally she was chronically ill appearing, uh, very thin and frail and uh, cachectic. Mental status, she was actually uh, maintaining fine and was oriented, was able to respond to questions. Um, her HENT, so the eye exam was just notable for this right corneal defect. Uh, in the mouth, she had poor dentition, but uh, there was extensive thrush that was noted. Um, heart was regular rhythm, uh, normal heart sounds, no murmurs. Her lung exam um, was actually clear without any ronchi or rails. For her abdomen, she did have uh, a midline surgical scar from her prior surgery. Her abdomen was soft, but a little uh, tender diffusely, no rebound. Her neuro exam, um, actually the cranial nerves were noted to be intact and was able to move and range all of her extremities uh, fine. And then extremity and skin exam, nothing, nothing remarkable as well uh, in terms of like rashes. Neck exam, fine, no nuchal rigidity and no photophobia. No. You were like looking in her eyes with the bright light. Uh, I don't think they reproduced that, but um, just from the history. With, and no with respect to And no, no lymphadenopathy. No. Well, this doesn't like add much. I mean, the the cachexia is really worrisome for again something chronic going on. But um, and I'm really happy. I mean, not happy that she has a right corneal defect, but I'm sort of relieved that that's where she's having the blurry vision. I still can't does not get her away from a back of the eye exam, but it really could be the corneal defect that's leading to this and not seem to be retinitis. Um, the poor dentition maybe maybe suggestive of a chronic anaerobic infection and aspiration and um, uh, and could have a mixed anaerobic infection. Um, extensive thrush is really suggestive that the dynophagia could be candidal in nature, but still can't rule out CMV or anything just from this exam. And um, nothing that suggests um, lymphoma on the abdominal exam, but that's not always suggestive. I'm kind of relieved that her neuro, neuro exam is so good, but it doesn't take us away from the fear of cryptococcal meningitis. It really can be, especially with such a low CD4 count in a way, you don't have a very high pleocytosis in your CNS. You don't have a very robust response. And we have been very surprised to see cryptococcus. So with that, with the headache, I cannot, you know, get away from needing to roll that out. Um, so that doesn't take it away. And then no signs of vascular angiomatosis, which would be suggestive of that cat scratch Bartonell exam, um, which would be kind of purplish splotches that, that are more raised than the flat splotches of KS. And there's no, sub, no signs here of KS, um, at least on skin exam. So that's kind of, it's reassuring, but it doesn't get you out of danger. Yeah, and touching on, you've talked about some of the additional information you want, like potentially moving in the direction of an LP, potentially some head imaging. Any, you know, in terms of next steps, where would you move forward at this point? Yeah, so all of those basic labs, like you said, but definitely adding on head CT, uh, even with the head CT being normal, um, you're only doing a head CT um, to make sure that it doesn't have elevated intracranial pressure for such a such an exam, um, for such head imaging, we're actually going to either need to get an MRI in someone with low CD4 counts or a CT with contrast if can't get an MRI, because we're really looking for encephalitis, which is in no way rolled out by anything that we've just said. So we are looking for white matter changes. We're looking for CMV, which is periventricular. We're looking for HSV, which is more encephalitis, which is more temporal. We're looking for HIV encephalite, encephalopathy. We're looking for JC virus or PML, um, uh, which is really white matter changes. So this is the only, only good imaging can get us that. The, L, the CT scan right now is to make sure that we can get an LP um, and safely. And the LP is going to be sent for all sorts of things, spectral, um, fungal, um, AFB, um, JC virus, uh, HSV, lots of lots of things, maybe even universal PCR eventually, but those are the main things. And then in terms of um, 
other tests that I'd want. Um, yes, the chest x-ray. Yes, I still want the eye exam. And then there's going to be a whole bunch of serologies that we send. Um, and those serologies, you know, sort of dependent on kind of where she is. But like, for example, we will plant, we will get a QFT like in someone like this to see if they've been exposed to TB. We would get a CRAG, a serum CRAG, and also a CSF CRAG. And the the that's cryptococcal antigen. Um, we will get COXI titers, and that's Comfix and EIA, just because COXI's in here somewhere. I don't see yet that we would go down the Bartonella route to get um IgG yet, but it's in my mind. Um, and then um, and then we would get um. We don't actually, this is really important actually, we don't get CMV antigen, not in um, people with HIV. For those of you when you're doing transplant, and I saw someone in the chat said that they're doing transplant, um, CMV antigen is a very good thing to, to help you figure out um, if you have um, CMV recurrence in the setting of transplant. This is not, CMV antigen can be up when you have HIV for like no reason. And it doesn't mean that the main process is CMV. So the way that we actually look for CMV is eventually an endoscopy because we're gonna have to figure out what's going on with the uh, dysphagia, um, uh, looking in the back of the eye um, and seeing if it looks like CMV retinitis. So it's not serologically diagnosed. Um, so let's first go like, I guess these kind of basic things. And then I think we'll, it will suggest to us what else to get. Um, and then the, the x-ray again, just because you have clear lungs, I know she doesn't have hypoxemia, but we still have to get a better chest image. Like we'll see if the chest x-ray has any suggestion of PCP and we may end up having to go to a chest CT. All right, great. So Jorge, what, did, um, what happened next in the case? Yeah, also I'll start with the basic labs. I think we, so we have our CD4, uh, 14, for uh, four percent rather than the two million. So the rest of the basic labs, starting with the uh, CBC, my count was two point nine, um, with a lower lymphocyte count, absolute lymphocyte count of uh, zero point two. Um, our hemoglobin was twelve point one, platelets ninety two. Moving to her chemistry, uh, sodium was one twenty five, potassium four, chloride ninety one. Bicarb 27, BUN was 11, creatinine 0 0.59, glucose was 68, and then her uh, FFTs, um, AST 77, ALT 57, ALKFOS was 914, T-BILLY 0 0.4, albumin 2.4. Um, so those are the basic labs. Um, should I go to imaging you put or the out class in there? Jazz, I think it was nine fourteen. Um, I mean, we have stuff to discuss. You know, even with this, like the main finding, I think, is that all the cell counts are down. Um, and so that could be, you could get that in end stage HIV, um, but you can also get that from MAC, um, which really infiltrates the bone marrow. In fact, the fastest way to actually diagnose MAC is to do a bone marrow biopsy and to look for um, gram positive, uh, sorry, AFB positive organisms. So that was always the fastest way that we diagnose MAC. Um, so that's, it also could be suggestive of lymphoma or an infiltrative, um, you know, non-bacterial, uh, but an infiltrative um, lymphoma disease. And then we, um, and then it could be in, in true of sort of viral illnesses. So even toxoplasmosis, CMV, um, EBV um, can, can lead to, to this kind of uh, low um, across the board counts. Um, doesn't have like an isolated uh, hematocrit deficiency, which would be more for um, parvovirus. Doesn't have an isolated low platelet, which would be ITP that you can get from HIV. So I'm more concerned about something infiltrative in the bone marrow versus just severe end stage HIV. But anything that's infiltrative is gonna be viral, cancer, 
um, or mycobacterial. And then um, the, the labs are, the other, the metabolic labs are concerning mostly for that ALKFAS. Oh, well, also the um, hyponatremia, which suggests something could be CNS related. And that definitely is getting me much more concerned about some sort of process in the head and beyond what we just said about encephalitis and meningitis and HIV itself and TB. We always have to think about the more infiltrative um, kind of space occupying lesions in the head that she's definitely susceptible to toxoplasmosis um, and um, also CNS lymphoma. And then um, and then the, the cholangiopathy or this high, it's weird, it's just an ALKFAS, it's not with total bile. And there were a lot of things that caused AIDS cholangiopathy. The main ones that caused AIDS cholangiopathy was HIV itself, CMV, cryptococcus, um, and, um, and, uh, and some of the other viral illnesses like HSV and EBV. And so I guess she could have, um, could have a uh, cholangiopathy. I also am like a little concerned that it's just ALKFAS. So I would maybe want that fractionated because that's a little weird um, that the billy is so flat. Um, so I would want to see that. And then I think the albumin is down from the chronic disease, though could have synthetic dysfunction from liver infiltration. So still always very worried about lymphoma, MAC, um, really curious about PTPTT here as well. But yeah, this is all just keeping our <laughs> differential really broad, actually, um, not necessarily narrowing it down, but, but these ones keep on coming up, MAC, lymphoma, um, TB, and CMV. These are like the ones that keep on coming up the most, I think, and cryptococcus. Wow, fantastic discussion. Um, Jorge, what happened next in this case? What imaging or labs did you do next? Yeah, so lots of things happened, lots of events. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll present the CT head and then chest imaging LP while the rest of the serologies are cooking. So um, the CT head was actually unremarkable, was interpreted as no acute finding. So no mass, no hemorrhage, no midline, no midline shift. Um, and then the chest x-ray. So the chest x-ray did see something. It was a patchy opacity left retrocardiac region without any effusions. Uh, so because of that, CT chest uh, angiogram was pursued. And that did demonstrate diffuse patchy ground glass opacities um, again, bilaterally, but it was there was a focal point in the left lower lobe. Uh, within that CT chest, there wasn't any mediastinal or higher lymphadenopathy that was seen, and again, no effusions. Um, and then, uh, oh, I guess before I do uh, talk about the LP, so uh, CT abdomen was done with contrast, showed a enlarged liver with uh, periportal edema mild intrahepatic biliary ductal dilation, gallbladder and extrahepatic biliary ductal wall edema with mucosal, hyper, uh, mucosal hyperenhancement. Spleen was normal and also no lymphadenopathy in the abdomen. Um, maybe we can pause there and then I'll move into the uh, LP results. So in terms of the lungs and abdomen, I guess those are the two main findings. Um, the lungs, the diffuse ground glass opacities can be PCP um, and likely would be given this low C4 count, but I don't think that explains everything that's going on. Um, and, you know, other causes of patchy opacities could be our viral illnesses. Um, so still thinking about CMV pneumonia, COVID, um, and uh, all the sort of routine um, viral pneumonias. Uh, that could happen and HSV can still certainly do this. And then we also have to think about like those atypicals. So it's not like they affect people living with HIV more necessarily, mycoplasma, chlamydia, um, but they're in the differential of like patchy opacities like this, but it also could be perineoplastic. So um, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonitis 
um, can just have this kind of very diffuse, it's very nonspecific finding, and so can paraneoplastic findings. I mean, it's going to be most likely sounding like PCP, and she definitely needs to be induced or look at the cytology for the trophozoites and cysts, which sound like they're parasitic, but they're not. It's really, it's really a fungi. Um, but, but think about these other causes. And then the infiltrative hepatic cholangiopathy, I mean, the gallbladder is infiltrated too. Um, that's that still could be, I think, our same same differential, which is mycobacterial versus uh, cancer, like lymphoma. And the mycobacterial, if we want to put it all together, we could have a mycobacterial process going on in the lungs, and also in the in the liver. It doesn't cause spleno, it's not causing splenomegaly in this case, or TB in the lungs and TB in the liver, or something else that causes cholangiopathy. So remember the cryptococcus. Um, CMV, HSV, and also our microspora and those those weird parasitic organisms that are that are AFB staining. They also cause clangiopathy. So we think we have to think about. We're still with our I think viral, which are the her, the DNA viruses, herpes DNA viruses, CMV being one of them, um, cancer and mycobacterial. And cryptococcus, right, Jorge. cryptococcus has to be in the in that clangiopathy differential as well. So we're still waiting for crag. I don't know if you got a crag, but that would be curious. Maybe you're going to tell me that later. Yeah, Jorge, do you want to show us um, what the LP and um, the next set of serology showed? Yeah, so uh, the LP, so opening pressure was 14. Uh, white count was 2. They did get a dip on on these on the white count. So uh, lymphs fifty six percent, PMNs one percent, monos forty three percent, zero RBCs. Uh, protein was forty eight, glucose was thirty three, which uh, her serum glucose at the time was seventy nine. Uh, CSF crag was negative, and then they got bacterial uh, fungal AFB which so far the prelim result on those was a bacterial gram stain that was negative. And then they also got a, um, HSV DNA, CMV DNA, West Nile, IgM, enterovirus, uh, VDRL. What was the, but we don't know the CMV yet. Or you'll tell me later. Oh, so the so the oh, sorry. the oh, those the are all viral, negative. Viral stuff was all negative, yeah. Okay. So maybe we could pause here, Monica. And if you mentioned actually uh, earlier on, you were saying that given um, the patient's immunocompromised status, that might affect you know potentially the LP results. And so I'm wondering if you could kind of interpret these normal or abnormal LP results and kind of how the immunocompromised state um, affects that interpretation. Yeah, I mean, that's um, when you have such a low total white count, then you can have, you can still be, you know, definitely inflamed and have your meninges be inflamed, um, but have a very bland um, CSF just like this because it really is that you can't mount that response. This also occurs in severe other immunodeficiencies is actually can be very ominous sign. Um, and like, for example, um, like severe cryptococcal meningitis with a low Y count is a very bad prognosis. So um, it doesn't mean anything that there's not a lot of inflammation. On the other hand, it could be encephalitis and then encephalitis doesn't necessarily um, uh, uh, reveal in the, menin in, the, in the meninges, these white counts. Now I am surprised that the CMV, HSV, are both negative. You said that, right? Because these other things aren't very common, like these metanuma. I mean, those are like more standard, but CMV, HSV were negative and did a JC virus get done too, would be curious. Um, but yeah, it doesn't mean that it's not bad, I guess, to not have a high pleocytosis. It can be, it just means that you have really extensive immunodeficiency. Right, right. All right, Jorge, what other serologies did you get or what, what happened next in the case? Uh, so, okay, so some of our serologies are coming back. Um, so they did get uh, like syphilis testing. Uh, TPPA was positive with an RPR of uh, 1 to 256. 
uh, beta D glucan was elevated greater than 500. Um, some basic uh, hepatitis serologies. So actually was found to have uh, chronic hep B with immunity. So poor antibody positive, surface antibody positive, but antigen negative, hep A uh, antibody negative, hep C antibody negative. Um, and then uh, uh, also, oh, respiratory viral panel, we talked, I think we talked about that was negative, COVID PCR negative. Um, and now a serum crack came back, uh, one to 1,024. That is in the CSF? This is in the serum. That's in the serum. Wow. Okay. So maybe we can pause there and talk about um, just how you would interpret that RPR and the, the serum crag and kind of can you infer anything from that really high titer or yeah, what's going through your mind with that high with that titer? Well, I mean, one thing that really is starting to make sense is kind of a, it doesn't mean that she doesn't have other things, but um, the serum crag being so high can be suggestive obviously that even the lung stuff is cryptococcus because again you can get cryptococcal pneumonia absolutely suggestive that that's what's going on in the, in the gallbladder because really such a such a like infiltrated gallbladder it and AIDS cholangiopathy is kind of just a few things which is HIV cryptococcus CMV and then um and then HSV and then these weird um, intestinal protozoa. So that could explain both those things. And it could, of course, explain the, um, what's going on in the head. And, and now I'm, you know, really worried that she has cryptococcal meningitis. So, but could that be like all of it? Well, she definitely also has, you know, active syphilis. Um, and, uh, that, so when we do the, um, when we do the LP, which is like absolutely the next step, um, not only we get, um, will we get the CSF crab, but we'll make sure that she doesn't have, we need to make a rule out from neurosyphilis because that would be a different treatment than, um, you know, um, primary or secondary. She doesn't have signs of a rash. And so neurosyphilis is in there. And then we need, um, you know, two weeks of, of IV therapy. So, so syphilis, I mean, you're going to send a whole bunch of things, but CSF crag and, um, and serum crag is, uh, sorry. And, um, and, uh, and VDRL and the um, RPR and the CSF are good, really important. Mycobacteria hasn't been ruled out and it doesn't mean it's not around. So it just takes a long time. So like meaning, unless we did a bone marrow biopsy, um, we would really need um, to do two, we, we draw two green top tubes, do get two, it makes the sensitivity more and actually do um, AFB cultures in the blood. It's just that that is going to take a while to come back. That's why you didn't tell me those, um, but, I just can't sit, you can't sit and just think it's one thing with someone with such a low CD4 count. So I can't like sit and think it's not Mac. I think it's all cryptococcus. Yes, that could explain it and that could do everything, but I still want to rule out these other things. Um, and I definitely want to uh, rule out AFB, but but cryptococcus is going to be one of the diagnoses, that's for sure. And one question I have is that since some of, as you said, some of these tests take a while to come back at at, at, would you start empiric therapy at any point? Also considering the risk of iris, like how, how would you think about empiric therapy and risk for iris in this case right now? Well, it's a really good question. I mean, because there's no signs or symptoms of bacterial, pyogenic bacterial illness. And that means, you know, even despite the, the photophobia um, and the signs of kind of meningitis, this is such a bland CSF. Um, the bacterial stain was negative. So no empiric antibacterials. We always want to just like really minimize those. Even this is not a transplant patient. So, so people with HIV, you don't consider like you throw antibiotics at them. Um, so no antibiotics at all. Um, and then, uh, and then the kind of empiric things that would happen, I wouldn't do anything MAC wise until we get these diagnoses. I wouldn't do anything. I mean, cryptococcus, you could start, um, uh, Amphophyvus, so you could. I mean, you know that there's gonna you're gonna have to treat cryptococcus, but the LP should be done within minutes. So, like, I would just wait and make sure that it's in the brain. I think it's gonna be, um, and also wait for the imaging, the head CT with contrast or the MRI. We need a better imaging of the brain. Um, but, but this is bringing up the question of the ARVs, the antiretrovirals, and the way I think about antiretrovirals 
is you start antiretrovirals no matter what. And I know she's on big TAF FTC, but there are only very rare circumstances where you don't start them. And one of them is actually cryptococcal meningitis. Now I know she's on it already, but the point is that like, if this was a new patient and, and new HIV diagnosis, there are only very few conditions where you wouldn't start ART right away. And why you wouldn't is because if you start ART right away, and that helps the immune response in your brain fight something like cryptococcus meningitis, you could actually make the process worse. And so we do not start um, ART in kind of only three rare circumstances. Um, one is severe cryptococcal meningitis, and that's usually with a high opening pressure um, and a low white count, which she, you know, she can fit in this criteria. At least the 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 opening pressure isn't that high, but the um, that is high, and the um, but it's mostly the low white count. So she could qualify for someone that we could make it worse. Um, again, she's on ART, but. This is, I'm giving you this hypothetical. And then the second is if you have another brain process where by treating it, you make like antigens break down and then you make the process worse. So that'd be like a toxoplasmosis brain lesion with a mass effect um, or, or um, any sort of brain lesion with a mass effect essentially. So just, it's so rare not to start ART, but but keep in mind the critical met cryptococcal meningitis is actually one of them. So she hadn't already been on big TAF FTC. I would not be starting her on ART yet. Not until I, until I got my cryptococcal meningitis and got my brain imaging. Got it. And I'm curious, wait, what was the third? I think you said there were three circumstances, the cryptococcal, the example of toxo. What was the third? <laughs> Unless I it's it. just those, I meant, I oh, guess, I didn't, yeah. I mean, I meant like something that anything with a mass effect, I guess. I and so I didn't, it, Toxo can have a mass effect, but something else with a mass effect that that is in there. So anything where you think that the intracranial pressure would go up because of breakdown, because your immune response is actually influencing the, the antigens and the clogging, and that's what's going to happen with cryptococcal meningitis, and you just don't want to make it worse. Got it. But in most circumstances, you start it. All right, Jorge, what ended up uh, happening in this case? All right, so Monica, you said you wanted VDRL. That was negative. Okay. CS CSF, yeah. Crag was, uh, CSF Crag was negative also. But now we got a lot of cultures coming back. So um, from the lungs, we do have pneumocystis, entropozites, also uh, cryptococcus neoformans in the lungs. Two out of two blood cultures with cryptococcus neoformans. And then finally, her CSF fungal culture with uh, cryptococcus neoformans. So it was almost all one diagnosis, except it was PCP to boot, right? Like the lung, the head, and the, the liver and the cholangiopathy, it's all cryptococcus. And then we have PCP um, in the lung on top of it. So it's not that parsimonious, it's two major things. And one thing I will say about the um, liver is that there are occasionally extra pyramidal symptoms of PCP, like PCP, we used to see this, I used to see this actually in the 90s with pneumocystis causing extra pyramidal symptoms, but that's usually when we used to give aerosolized pentamidine. And if you gave that, you kept the lungs clear from PCP because it was just helping your lungs not get PCP and it would drive the PCP out and then you would get extra pyramidal PCP like lung or spleen. So it doesn't mean that PCP isn't in there, it doesn't matter. At some point, I mean, we're going to treat both PCP and we're going to treat um, cryptococcus. And because it's growing out of the CSF, we're going to go serious on that on that treatment for cryptococcus. We're not going to do fluke. We're going to start with info. Yeah, Jorge, can you share how this patient was treated and if you know how the how the patient did? Yeah. So initially, actually, patient was treated with just uh, fluconazole. Um, the the headaches they were like pretty vague um and uh they did have the the crag titer uh but they weren't concerned yeah. yet about cns so it actually was i can understand the before the csf culture grew out why you just do fluke especially mm -hmm. since 5 C is not great for these low white counts and and, and ampho is really toxic so that totally makes sense mm -hmm. and then they uh was an empiric uh PJP pneumonia treatment also, and then um, was on like some broad uh, empiric 
uh, antibiotics, but once the gram stain was negative in the CSF, that got peeled back. So main things was uh, PJP treatment, fluke, which was then escalated to amphotericin flu flucytosine, and uh, actually like received induction therapy, uh, and you know did actually did not pass away despite you know ha having this poor prognostic factor of zero white blood cells essentially in the CSF. Um, to this date, is still alive. So, I mean, just to say a couple of things about the the treatment. PCP, I'm sure, got started on trimethoprim sulfa. That's fine, but we were going to like be watching those white counts because it just is not great that we're starting with such low white counts. So just keep in mind that there are other treatments for PJP, like clindaprimaquine, um, that no problem like taking those out if septra causes us any problems. And then same with the 5FC. When we induced with AMFO and 5FC, the 5FC is really bad in terms of poisoning, you know, the, the ca causing sort of white count and bringing all your cell lines down. So we're always watching 5FC in this case, like it would make me nervous a little bit. And the thing about, I mean, yes, like in this culture, what I mean is in the United States, we do induce, if you have cryptococcal meningitis with AMFO B and 5FC, but there have been a lot of studies in low and middle income countries about giving just one dose of Ampho B that was just at ID week last week, uh, last year in October, just inducing with one dose of Ampho B and then just going forth with your high dose fluconazole. And the WHO guidelines for cryptococcal meningitis, recognizing that Ampho B is hard to get and hard to do all the monitoring like K and MAG that you have to monitor actually recommends high dose fluconazole without the, if, if you must in a low and middle income setting, just do the 800 or, or even higher, um, fluke dosing. So we can, any signs of toxicity, I'd like immediately go back down to fluke and not do the AMFO 5FC if we get any toxicity. And then remember the scepter will cause toxicity and we always have other P PJP things, um, treatments, mainly clindopromocin and pentamidine, but that's very toxic. Well, I mean, I'm and no point yeah, in ahead. taking off the big TAF FTC, by the way. Like, this wasn't a high enough, like, intracranial pressure to cause any, like, you know, intraventricular findings. And um, the CRAG wasn't even, you know, in the CSF. I mean, definitely it was in the CSF because it grew. But no point in taking off big TAF FTC. Keep the ART on. Yeah, and Jorge, I wanted to ask you, first of all, thank you so much for preparing this case and kind of presenting it in a way that um, just fostered so much incredible uh, discussion and teaching from Monica. I wanted to hear from you kind of what learning points really stood out to you, like if there were a few that you really wanted to, to highlight for everyone listening, what, um, what were some learning points that stood out to you? Yeah, I, I think there's... Uh three main ones in my mind. So number one was, you know, when we see a patient with this severe immunosuppression with a very low CD4 count, like Monica was mentioning, as we get at the HPI, like multiple processes can be happening at once um, and almost surely are. So uh, as an ID fellow, you see this patient, you get to your assessment and plan. There's not just one problem. There's a list of problems, one through five. Think of all the symptoms that you're seeing. Think of differentials. Um, and so similarly, like when you're on transplant ID, yeah, you just have this mindset that this patient in front of me can have more than one process going on. So that's that's number one. Um, I think number two is just the this presentation of cryptococcal meningitis, or basically disseminated cryptococcal disease with uh, blood, uh, pulmonary, and CNS involvement. Um, I mean, I think there's so many different presentations of cryptococcal meningitis that I've I've seen and have probably been described. Uh, you can have a subacute presentation with uh, fevers, confusion, uh, meningismus, ataxia, and then some signal on uh, CSF. Um, or maybe it's it's longer last, like symptoms are longer lasting uh, and CSF profile is is quite bland. Um, and then others, there's other presentations that have, I think have been atypical. I've seen cryptococcal meningitis presenting with strokes. Um, so there's lots of different flavors of uh, cryptococcal meningitis presentations. So just be aware of that. And then also really think about the CSF profile that you're seeing. And then I think the last point I wanted to highlight is uh, the serum crag titers or just crag titers in general. So 
patient had a very high serum crack titer. Um, I think you can think of the higher the titer is, the more indicative that there's probably going to be disseminated disease. Um, there's three assays that we have. There's a lateral flow assay. There's an ELISA and a latex agglutination assay. So each one is going to kind of give you a different number. So try to find out which one that your uh, institution is using and compare to uh, a different one that the patient might have had previously. At San Francisco General, uh, we have the latex agglutination assay, which I actually had just learned today. Um, at our other hospital at UCSF Parnassus, they use the uh, um, lateral flow assay, which that one actually has a fourfold higher titer. So you can imagine if this patient, uh, this patient was at San Francisco General Hospital, but if he had had her titers gone uh, with the lab at Parnassus, uh, the titer would have been fourfold higher. Again, so it makes sense with the, the presentation with the 70 disease. Um, so those are the three points I would, I would mention. Patient can have more than one process going on. Think of the different flavors of cryptococcal meningitis uh, um, presentations. And also think about the CSF and then the, the crack titer uh, elevation. Wow, that was just incredible teaching on crag titers, the illness script for cryptococcal meningitis. Um, Thank you so much for that incredible teaching, Jorge, and um, for just presenting this case. Um, and then before we end the session, Monica, I just wanted to turn to you to if you had any reflections on what it was like to discuss the case, and if also if you had any kind of uh, kind of like last teaching points you want to leave um, for any for anyone listening. Well, um, I just thank you so much for presenting this because it's really not unusual and. Just we are seeing with the setbacks with COVID, what happened during COVID, and also just people having different issues with taking ARVs. We are not, I mean, this is not unusual to see OIs and to see people who are really sick from AIDS. And we definitely see this here in our hospitals. So I guess I would say um, HIV is not over. Uh, we have so much to do. I think you should all go into infectious disease and then you should go into HIV and don't do GI or cardiology. What else you guys are thinking of? <laughs> There's only one field. That's my last parting comment. <laughs> I love it. Well, um, he, I'm just really blown away, Monica, by kind of the clarity of your teaching, how you just right at the very beginning were kind of suspicious that there were multiple processes going on with uh, this immunocompromised host and kind of the clarity of the four buckets of infectious etiologies and um, really how you kind of navigated this whole case. So thank you both so much for, for your time, for discussing this case, for presenting. Um, and we'll end the session there. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you. Thank you, you so much. Bye. Bye, Jorge. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.